Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. It's March 31st, 2020, and I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline. Today we speak with acclaimed environmental journalist John Vidal about the coronavirus pandemic's links to the wildlife trade and the destruction of nature. Vidal, who was the environment editor for UK newspaper The Guardian for many years, recently wrote a piece looking at how the loss of habitat and biodiversity driven by human activities is creating the perfect conditions for outbreaks of zoonotic diseases like COVID-19. We speak with Vidal today about what we know about the origins of COVID-19, what he's learned while reporting from disease outbreak epicenters in the past, and how the destruction of nature creates the perfect conditions for diseases like COVID-19 to emerge. This is not a natural disease. This is a man-made pandemic. This is is man-made problem. I mean, we have, by going into the forest, by going in and by totally disturbing the relationship, the normal relationship between humans and other species, we have created the conditions for these epidemics, pandemics to come out. No longer can we see humans as separate from nature, which was the old traditional point of view. That has now completely gone out of the window. But first, here's the top news. Wildlife authorities across Africa have effectively locked down parks that are home to gorillas, chimpanzees, and bonobos, amid concerns that the COVID-19 pandemic could make the jump to great apes. Humans and great apes share more than 95% of the same genetic material and are susceptible to many of the same infectious diseases, ranging from respiratory ailments to Ebola. Virunga National Park in the Democratic Republic of the Congo shut its doors to tourists this week, while in Rwanda all parks hosting gorillas and chimpanzees were also shut. Uganda is considering doing the same, with its parks de facto closed because of a drop in tourist arrivals. Even if the apes avoid COVID-19, the loss of tourism revenue for the parks and potential loss of income for people who work to protect these species could cause enduring damage to conservation efforts, experts say. Scientists have discovered that the shells of bioluminescent shrimp not only glow, but can detect light as well. Many deep-sea creatures emit light to help find prey or avoid predators. Scientists have long known that small organs called photophores are responsible for this bioluminescence. A recent study of deep-sea shrimp in the Florida Straits shows that photophores can also detect light, acting like rudimentary eyes all over the body. This finding adds to the growing body of research documenting photosensitive organs outside the eyes in a variety of animals, but is the first such demonstration in deep-sea creatures. And lastly... Seychelles, an archipelago nation in the Indian Ocean, has extended protection to 400,000 square kilometers, or 154,000 square miles, of its seas, an area twice the size of Great Britain. The move fulfills the country's long-standing pledge to safeguard 30% of its marine waters. Nearly half of the new marine protected areas created by the Seychelles government will be no-take zones, where economic activities such as fishing, mining, or drilling will not be allowed. In the other half, economic activities will be allowed subject to regulation. Conservationists say this is a step in the right direction, but the bigger challenge will be for the government to effectively manage the vast network of marine protected areas. A Debt for Nature deal allowed the country to restructure its sovereign debt and free up $21.6 million to fund the creation of the marine protected areas, as well as measures for adapting to the impacts of climate change. Seychelles waters host giant tortoises, nesting sites for turtles, the last remaining population of dugongs in the Indian Ocean, and fragile coral reef ecosystems that the new marine protected areas aim to protect. Read more about all of today's top news items at mangabay.com. And if you'd like to request email alerts when we publish new stories on the topics you care about most, visit alerts.mangabay.com and sign up. These days, you don't have to be an epidemiologist to be hearing a lot about zoonotic diseases, which are diseases that are passed from animals to people. The global pandemic brought on by the outbreak of the novel coronavirus disease COVID-19 has affected just about everybody. But as the longtime environmental editor for The Guardian, John Vidal has been writing about zoonotic disease outbreaks for years. In 2004, for instance, he visited a small village in northern Gabon that was the site of an Ebola epidemic in the late 90s as part of an investigation into why diseases kept emerging from biodiversity hotspots like the tropical forests and bushmeat markets of Africa and Asia. As the current coronavirus pandemic spread across the world, Vidal penned an article co-published by The Guardian and nonprofit media outlet Encia that looks at how scientists are beginning to understand the ways that environmental destruction makes zoonotic disease epidemics more likely. Early on in the current pandemic, there was quite a bit of misinformation out there, one of the most prominent bits of which was that pangolins had passed COVID-19 on to humans. But the reality is that while scientists say bats are most likely the ancestral host of the coronavirus, we don't know exactly which species was the intermediary host between bats and humans. 
I think it's very unclear still what exactly passed what on to whom. Uh, there's so much uh, circumstantial evidence that it was uh, at the Wuhan wet market, which is notorious for the range of animals, uh, live animals which are, which are sold there and slaughtered there. Uh, but there's no science which backs that up yet. Uh, and it, maybe it's quite convenient for, for people to, to, to blame this market. We don't actually know. Uh, but I would suspect it's got something to do with that. Um, the science, the science will emerge over over the next year. I think the pangolin is, it is the most trafficked animal in the world. Uh, so it it, you know, it it kind of does make some sort of sense, uh, but we still don't know. In his Guardian Encia piece, Vidal discusses how the thinking used to be that nature harbors all these deadly viruses and pathogens, and humanity must be on guard, but that now scientists believe that the real threat is humanity's destruction of nature and biodiversity. There's been an enormous shift in thinking, I would say, in, certainly in the last 50 years. Um, I'm a colonial boy. I was brought up in West Africa. I remember my, my parents saying the forest is dangerous. You will, you will get diseased. The, 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 the forest is a diseased forest. That was the, that was the cry of the, the British, the Americans, the people who, from, from, from the north who, who went to West Africa, went into the Central African forest. That you, you go in there at, at your peril, you will die. The forest is dangerous. Africa is dangerous. And I think that's turned around completely now. The science is increasingly showing that it is man's activities in the forest which create the danger, which create the conditions for which pathogens can, uh, can, can jump species, can move into different uh, areas. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing with the, such has been the disturbance of nature, especially in these rich hotspot biodiversity hotspots, uh, that it seems absolutely clear that this is, this is, um, uh, this is where the, the, the danger is. Man is the danger, it is not the forest. I think there's two aspects of, of, of why destroying nature creates the problem. One of which is that most natural environments are beneficial to the people who live or the, the creatures which which live in them they have they they have reached a a, a level of an ecological balance uh, which is over centuries over eons has developed and most people in living most humans who live in uh, in, in in say in deep forests or indigenous peoples will say that we live happily with nature we can live happily in the forest we don't we know we we, we understand how uh, the, the medicines the forest is our pharmacy the forest is our is our friend as we as we take it down we destroy the if you like the remedies for the natural illnesses which are which are there i mean the forest is not obviously is dangerous to a point uh, but we we destroy our chances of 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 living in it or living or working with it i i think that increasingly the options for people the, the options for animals get so much thing if you remove some of the animals you change the ecological balance you, you might change the relationship between i don't know a host species the bats may not have the same uh, species which they can feed on, the same fruits they can feed on, they will look for something else. Again, the pathogens will look for something else. And so you're going to get this mixing of bacteria, of, of pathogens, and, and you will get different new emerging diseases, I'm sure. Scientists have found a strong correlation between habitat destruction and emerging infectious disease. It is just remarkable that, that, that as the as the forests come down, as nature is destroyed, so we are getting more and more of these outbreaks. It's not a coincidence. Uh, in the last 30, 40 years, I mean, we've recorded 330 odd new diseases coming out of, out of disturbed nature. The correlation between the, the destruction and the disease emerging is very, very strong. A lot of science backs that up. So, for instance, the, in the, the, the 35 Ebola cases that have been in, uh, in the last 20 years or whenever it is, uh, something like 29 have been in disturbed areas of forest. Uh, and it's the same with mosquitoes and so on and so forth. And the, what they're also finding, what the ecologists are also discovering, is that uh, the richness of nature is actually a protection. Uh, so it, it sounds odd, but the more diversity there is, the stronger 
is the protection for all those different species because they're not jumping they're, they're living on they don't need to move across species they have got their own and they live quite harmoniously with them so i think we disturb nature at our peril in the early 2000s you did some reporting from a village in gabon that was at the center of an ebola outbreak did you see anything there that might shed light on our current pandemic i've been up to that 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 corner of central africa is quite extraordinary um it's where cameroon meets gabon meets Congo. Uh, and it was extremely forested until very, very recently, in fact. And uh, it's where maybe four of the, lo- the big five uh, really dangerous pathogens have, ha- ha- have come out of. So you've had uh, Ebola, you've had HIV, you've had Marburg, uh, you have monkeypox, you have all kinds of things coming out of there over the last 20, 30 years. And th- the question is, um, you know, it was any of that due to the deforestation and the mining and the road building which was going through it. Now, I went out to uh, Gabon and Congo uh, some years ago, I've been out there several times, um, and it didn't actually strike me to start with. I didn't think that this would be the the case, but the the more I looked at it, the more you could see that the the forest was being disturbed around the villages, uh, clear cutting in some places, uh, subsistence farming in other places. Uh, This is some of the densest, most biodiverse, uh, richest nature in the world. Um, and is very well known for having, you know, all the great African uh, mammals living in it, um, especially bats and rats. And, and areas. So the point was that, you know, when you put it together, then you find, then you find that the science is actually catching up with observation. And the science is now very clear that, that there is a link between the degradation of nature, the destruction of biodiversity, and the diseases, and hu- diseases which have passed to humans. The relationship between humans and nature is changing very, very much. So that those villages, uh, and especially the um, villages of the indigenous uh, pygmy tribes out there, they were never frightened of nature. But the forest was our home, that's what they said. Now, as the forest comes down, as the palm uh, plantations move in as the miners move in they are frightened of the of the of the forest and this is a fantastic change um, and uh, so it's a it's a real sense that the humanity having depended having learned to depend on richness of nature is now actually becoming quite frightened of it um, and probably with very very good reason as Vidal reports The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate that three-fourths of new or emerging diseases that infect humans originate in animals. And in his article, Vidal quotes Kate Jones, Chair of Ecology and Biodiversity at University College London, who says that species-integrated habitats are likely to carry more viruses which can infect humans. Uh, you know, it, it's very interesting that, that, that uh, what zoologists think now is that, I mean, and it makes sense. If you, if you take down a forest, if you even selectively cut a forest, you are going to frighten off the big animals. You will, you know, the pangolins will go, the, uh, the chimps will go, the monkeys will go, and so on and so forth. They, they can rush away fairly easily. But what you're left with is the smaller animals, and they've got nowhere left. Now, they just want a new host. I mean, they, the pathogens and, and so, which have quite happily lived on the, on, the, on the other animals for a very, very, very long time. They need to go somewhere and they choose whatever they can and they will choose humans. And they make, there's no difference between one species and another for a pathogen. It will just latch onto whatever it can. So in other words, the, it's, the, it's the little boys, it's the, it's the rats and the bats and the, and the gnats and the midges and the mosquitoes. And these are the animals which are, or these are the creatures uh, the wildlife which is left in degraded forest, and that's what latches on to humans. Humans are mammals, and, and, and so bats, which are mammals also, are, will naturally go towards uh, other, other mammals. I, I think it's, it's becoming clear. Now, it's very difficult to get the good science on this in the sense that not much work has been done. It makes instinctive sense, but it doesn't necessarily stack up in enough scientific papers yet. Uh, but I'm sure it will because this is the way that, that, that all the thinking is going. There's a new scientific discipline emerging known as planetary health that focuses on these types of connections between the well-being of humans, wildlife, and the ecosystems that support us all. I found this really fascinating. Planetary health is a relatively new concept coming out of places like Harvard and the Rockefeller Center and, and, and various other uh, thinking in UK and, and, and where it's really making the point that until now w- what we've had is we've had you've had human health which has been 
uh, looked after or preserved and studied by doctors. You've had animal health, which has been looked after and studied by veterinarians. And you've had environmental health, which has been looked after and studied by ecologists. Now, what nobody has done is really put it together and see that actually maybe you need to look at all three of those things to have any sort of health. So that, that human health actually depends on the wider environment and vice versa. In fact, if you destroy the environment, you destroy human uh, habitation within it and again this is this is again an emerging emerging science um, it's very exciting it makes it makes complete sense how far down that road you can go again the not enough uh, research has been done uh, but it does it, it is beginning to make sense if anything it seems like the coronavirus pandemic we're dealing with now is really driving home the point that we need to consider the health of the planet and wildlife as part of human health I think you're absolutely right. And I think that, that what, what is emerging for me is the idea is that this is not a natural disease. This is a man-made pandemic. This is, this is man-made problem. I mean, we have, by going into the forest, by going in and by totally disturbing the relationship, the normal relationship between humans and other species, we have created the conditions for these, these um, uh, epidemics, pandemics to, 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 to come out. I think someone said very wisely, this is the, 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 you know, the, this is the great accelerator. You know, what we've seen over the last 30, 40, 50 years is this fantastic change in the global environment. So we've seen forests coming down on an on unimaginable scale. We've seen uh, oceans change. We've seen the air change. We're seeing every, the climate is changing, obviously. Um, and we put these all together. And what we're seeing is the, the whole environment being disturbed. And of course, that will mean the human environment as well. No longer can we see humans as separate from nature, which was the old traditional uh, point of view. That is now completely gone out of the window. The Chinese government says COVID-19 came from a wet market or a wildlife market in the city of Wuhan, where all kinds of animals are sold for human consumption. Vidal spoke with experts at the International Institute of Environment and Development, however, who say that instead of wet markets, the much broader trade in wild animals is the real culprit. The trade is not, is, this is not just a small trade. This is a multi-billion dollar trade. This is providing enormous quantities of food in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. Uh, this is the traditional way of, of, of providing protein for, uh, for, for, for uh, very large uh, numbers of people. Um, and strangely, as urbanization increases, um, so wild wildlife, um, bushmeat as they call it, um, becomes actually more popular. It becomes a, a luxury for the very wealthy and it becomes a necessity for the very uh, for the poor who cannot get their protein from any other source. So it's a combination of, of never been more popular to go into, into forest. And so the hunters are earning vast amounts of money now. So you can get a pangolin in the forest for a fiver, five dollars say, by the time it gets to the center of Libreville or, or Lagos or, or, or Kinshasa, it may be a hundred dollars. And then the global international trade is coming in. So the pangolins are going out to China or wherever, and they're being sold for $250 uh, by the time they get to Beijing. It's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. And, and the growth of the wildlife, Mongape has written very, very well about it. I have to say, you know, I, I, I was very impressed by a lot of the reportage which you guys have done. Uh, it's an extraordinary situation where the, the, the biodiversity of the world is, has, has never been more in the, in, the, uh, in the public domain and yet has never been more uh, popular to, to um, destroy wildlife. The, one of the problems I see is that all the, uh, the conservation bodies have made it very, very difficult for people to import or to export uh, charismatic megafauna, the big, you know, the parts of the tiger, the lion, or wherever. But nobody's paying any attention to to what's really going on in the forest, which is this emptying by by a very, very organized uh, global trade. China has temporarily banned not just the trade, but the consumption of wildlife in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. Some conservationists hope that that is a precursor to the country adopting a permanent ban, which would have huge implications for the global wildlife trade because China is a major consumer country of trafficked wildlife. Would that also help stem outbreaks of novel zoonotic diseases? If China installed a permanent ban on the wildlife trade, it would make a difference. Clearly, it is a huge country with an enormous 
uh, problem of mixing medicine with uh, wildlife and uh, it, 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 it is a very very big cultural problem in China but I think two things that were one of which is um, in the past you've had SARS we had SARS in 2002-2003 and that killed I mean a lot of people China banned the wet markets then within two three years they'd come back uh, it's the same with Ebola in Africa when you had the huge West African Ebola outbreak in uh, uh, in 2000 and 12, 13, 14, uh, again, all the wet markets closed and everybody was frightened of, of eating wild animals. And now they've all reopened again. The point is that this is a global thing. This is Latin America. This is Africa. This is not just China. This is, this is absolutely everywhere. Um, and it's linked to poverty. It's linked to human poverty as, as the cities, as, as, as populations grow, and the cities explode. Uh, so you're getting more desperation, more poor people, and they want cheap food. And traditionally, cheap food has been the bushmeat trade. Aside from ending the wildlife trade, what else could we do? What else should we do? And what lessons should we learn to prevent the next zoonotic disease outbreak? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I, 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 the, less, the lessons to be learned, I think these, these are going to emerge over the next you know, few months. One of which, obviously, is some kind of regulation of the trade, much better regulation of the markets. I mean, that has to be in developing countries as well as in rich countries. Because don't forget, a lot of pangolins and, and bushmeat ends up in America, ends up in London, and so on and so forth. It's not just a poor country problem. Uh, so, you know, we're bringing, it's a miracle in a way that it didn't happen in Lagos or in New York or London. There are very large uh, communities of people who very much like, very rich people who very much like their their uh, their bushmeat and they get it imported from wherever they want so that's number one let's have some you know proper surveillance proper thing secondly you know it's up to the rich countries have poured money into africa and china up to a point um and uh, but nothing has gone to try and to control uh, the wildlife trade there's been no money for regulation of it um, it starts with hunters. I mean, the hunters, you know, it, it, it only takes a hunter to go into a forest to, to bring out something and you've got a potential problem. Well, let's start educating the hunters. Let's start education on a much bigger scale. Uh, it's very, very important. Um, but I don't think it's even just, just the trade. I think it's more a sort of an attitude that which, which, which we have, which is that this is somebody else's problem far, far away, which we can, you know, they have to work it out. No, this is our problem. The problem is the consumption. We, in, certainly in London, and I suspect in New York and wherever, we are the people who are demanding the high-end furniture, which we demands that the forests come down. You know, we want the we want the Oroco trees, we want the mahoganies. We, to get those trees, you have to take down the forest to get the forest. You need the roads to get the roads. You bring in the you bring in the hunters and so on. The whole thing sort of spirals from there. So it starts with consumption in the north, uh, and uh, and and we have to control that in some way. If you enjoy the Mangabe Newscast, we ask that you please consider becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash mangabe. Just a dollar per month will really help us offset production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please support the Mangabe Newscast at patreon.com slash mangabe. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash mangabe. And don't forget you can subscribe to the Manga Bay Newscast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, CastBox, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And of course, you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. If you'd like to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash mangabay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at mangabay on both those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks.